Oh, there he is. Pursuant to chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, this meeting will be conducted by a remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so in the following manner, by emailing Steve McCarthy at McCarthyS at AmherstMA.gov. That's M-C-C-A-R-T-H-Y-S at AmherstMA.gov. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. In the event that we are unable to do so, and for, for reasons of economic hardship and despite best efforts, we will post on the town website an audio or video recording, transcript, or other comprehensive record of proceedings as soon as possible after the meeting. And with that done, we'll call the meeting to order at 5.02 p.m. Um, take a roll call of attendance. Dylan. Here. Kelly. Here. Gaston. Here. Doug. Here. And I'm here. So we are all here. Um, so hello. Um, let's see, public comment. Is there anyone here for general public comment, not related to any hearing or discussion item on the agenda? Just. If so, please uh, raise your hand inside there so we can see you. That's right. Raise your hand. And thanks, Steve. Nope. Okay. No public comment. So moving on to licenses, uh, section three. So special short-term alcohol serving licenses. Steve, you said that Raymond Berry has withdrawn his? Yes. Okay. That so, was to be for the, um, the uh, block party, but... Um, it did not work out as planned and um, there won't be enough time for a revised application, so. Okay, all right. Um, so we go on to SST-22-37, Bill Pete, Top of Campus Incorporated, All Alcohol Fine Arts Savannah Sharp Center on September 16th at 6.30. And is Mr. Pete here or someone from Top of the Campus? I or don't no? believe so. Um, oh, no. This is... Um, the UMass did submit a big batch of um, of liquor licenses, um, okay. and uh, this was just the first of them. I wanted to make sure this one got on the agenda because it will be very close to the uh, okay the um, the next hearing date. The rest of them should be on for next time, but they haven't been reviewed by the police chief, so okay. I figured it's best to wait for the rest of them. And then this is the um, the maps from the the Fine Arts Center lobby liquor site plan, and the Fine Arts Center hall site plan. That's what those are connected to, right? Yes. And this is just like a lot of their previous ones. Yeah, yeah they, they do this for all the, um, the events there, I believe, or a lot of them anyway. Okay, great. Well, uh, does anyone have any questions or comments about this license application? Um, or not? Or do we just want to move into, does it look okay to everyone? And willing to entertain a motion at any point. If it looks all right. I'll move to approve the short-term liquor license SST 2237. Thank you, Doug, um, for the motion. Is there a second? I'm second it. Thank you, Dylan. Any further discussion? If not, we'll take a vote. Dylan. Aye. Kelly. Aye. Gaston. Aye. Doug. Aye. And I vote aye, and the license is approved. So that one's done. Okay. Um, moving on to the common pictures license, um, CV-102 Goddess Green LLC, 19 North Pleasant Street. And we also got paperwork for this one. And yes. And if there's so, anybody who wants to speak on behalf of this application, right. just uh, raise your hand on the side there so I can... I believe our two guests are here for that, but. Oh, great. Okay. So if someone would like to um, I introduce will allow this. I them to talk. And if you are not here for this, then we can. Hi, we're both here. Chandra Hart and Janice Sampson of oh. the screen. <laughs> Hi, great. Thanks. Welcome. Um, so uh, could you can maybe give us a little background, what your business is like? Um, yes, so we are opening up an organic juice bar um, in the old glazed donuts location. Um, all of our products will be locally sourced. Um, it is a franchise. Um, we're doing uh, just juices, smoothies, uh, acai bowls, acai bowls, 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 bowls,
correct, yeah. Okay. So it's gonna be in a, a, a little cafe in oh. the center of town. Okay, great, thanks. And I was looking through the paperwork, so no BYOB. Um, fantastic. Does anyone have any questions for the representatives of Goddess Green this evening? Any concerns about the license application? No, if not, um, is there a motion to approve? So moved. Thank you, Doug. Is there a second? Second. Thanks, Dylan. Any further discussion? Nope. Okay, let's take a vote. Dylan. Aye. Hallie. Aye. Gaston. Aye. Doug. Aye. And I vote aye. Uh, that is five to zero. Um, the license is approved. Thank you so much for coming in and Thank you. best of luck with your enterprise. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Up. Thanks. Great. Bye. 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 Okay. Licenses are over with. So um, on to discussion items. Adult use marijuana regulations. Everyone got the draft and then the draft with correction or suggestions on it. Um, so who's, where, Steve, was that your work or? Yeah, the, uh, yeah. The, the the changes in the comments were mine. Okay, great. Do you want to uh, just walk us through those quickly? I think every, I was reading through them, but. Um, yes, let me yes, okay. pull that up. That would be great, thank you. Um, so I did speak with Doug about this earlier today. So um, okay. we, uh, he, he, uh, this was just kind of a, a placeholder in the title. So, so we will remove that for the final edition. Um, just a couple um, formatting things there. Um, moving down this, this is all as, uh, as Doug provided to me, just kind of reformatted to, to fit could, everything. I'm sorry to interrupt, Steve. There's one quick thing. If you go back to definitions, that I'll mm -hmm. point out now, um, you know, we have a definition for licensed premises. You know, there was a longer conversation that, that Steve and I had later uh, regarding topics further down in the, in the, uh, you know, in the document where we, we may want to fine tune that a little bit. It may be, it, it's pretty broadly defined here and it may be poses some uh, headaches for us <laughs> later on. Uh, so we just, we were thinking about some ways to kind of refine that definition a little bit. Um, you know, I think that in, in some ways having it broad like this is helpful, but there are there are circumstances and and uh, and current actual um, uh, businesses, you know, in this in this area that that it could make certain things kind of a headache for them because they're in a kind of a block. It's not a standalone building. So mm -hmm. that was a case that we started thinking about is like, oh, if you're not in a standalone building and we say, you know, it's sort of the area around you, does that start to beg the question about inclusion of a bunch of things that we may not have intended when we sort of wrote this. So I think that's an area we, we may fine tune that license premises a little bit to, to be a little more uh, precisely or narrowly defined. Mm -hmm. Thanks for letting me interrupt, Steve. Oh, no problem, Doug. Please uh, interrupt ahead as we go through this. Um, so um, yeah, a question I had with this one was, um, you know, if this was a new application, would this be referring to um, other establishments owned by the applicant or would it be a condition for renewal? And would this be a, a hard condition where if there had been any issues, the license wouldn't be renewed or issued? Um, and Doug and I had a little conversation about that. Mm -hmm. um, maybe something. Yeah, it's a consideration, I think, in, in our determining, you know, uh, whether to grant a license or not, I think is the way I would, would imply that I think is, you know, part of it's about developing a, a plan. Um, and then, you know, whether that, you know, they've been able to be successful in uh, implementing that plan is a factor in our decision making, but it wouldn't, uh, I think the, the intent of the language is to be broad. So we have a rationale if we choose to to deny, but we don't have to. So if there's circumstances or whatever, I think that's part of what we're doing with that. Uh, I wonder if we can address the the comment simply by um, after the and doing if applicable. 
the applicant has developed and if applicable successfully implemented I do like that. I didn't even catch yeah. it the first time. We'll do track changes here. Um, and I'm thinking about this a little bit more. Uh, maybe, maybe instead of there have been no, since it's something for the LLA to consider whether there have been any reported incidents. I think that would kind of accomplish the, um, the thrust. So wait. So this, are you talking about renewals or initial licenses or both? I, I, this. I think both. Both? I, yeah. So if someone's in, like recent employment history has something in it. I, I, I think the, we've got an issue with the, the um, in, English or syntax at this point. Um, um, so it's the, oh, yes, one, I see. yeah. Okay. So you you want to use the, if applicable to a, relate also to reported incidents, is that it? Or should we just do a new sentence or a new number? Yeah. Maybe we'll just do a whole new number. Okay. I mean, if, if, what we can consider is just reported incidents, any reported incidents, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I like that. Um, should we be, in, in basically, should we include a concept of affiliates in case the applicant owns or is affiliated with other um, re retail establishments? And though the, what happens at the other retail establishments are, are also relevant for our consideration. I would yeah. suggest yes, uh, Doug. I would suggest yes because I think you know when we think about liquor license applications, you know. Uh, on those on the ABC form, I think it has them list uh, other licenses that they own or are a party to, and and whether there've been any violations recently. So I think that was the intention here was to kind of capture something similar. So yeah, I would say yes, we would want to include that as a consideration. It may not be, you know, a deal breaker, but it's something to consider. Um, I wonder. I mean, just as a matter of drafting, we can kind of say the applicant and and its affiliates where, where that's relevant. Uh, or I wonder if we could also just include the affiliates in the de definition of applicant. Um, I mean, it's not something that we can try to resolve now, but I, I think there's different ways to, to skin the cat drafting wise. Yeah, yeah, actually, I actually had an interesting conversation with the town's um, finance director yesterday. And um, this is not a, a fully baked plan or a discussion that's been conclusively had, but he said that there may be interest in um, using this um, to actually completely replace the host community agreements next year, um, because um, I believe there's been some changes with the legislation for that, and um, all of them come up for expiration in a couple, or I think next year or the year after. So um, we may actually end up getting um, quite in detail with a lot of different things about application form and what information is required, and um, you know, almost to, to parallel the alcohol um, methodology. And, and I, th I think. Um, yeah, we could we could get we could get a lot a lot deeper in this and um and maybe yeah, fill out you know kind of have a difference between initial application and um renewal and what's looked at for that kind of thing. If I can just ask a, a side question, is the idea that we're trying to kind of clean up a, a a nice draft that we then use to get the conversation going with the council? Is that the kind of conception of steps? I mean, yeah. Um, yeah, I think in some respects, I think that's the idea is that we have kind of a clean version uh, because, you know, we, we will actually, the actual first step is them granting us, you know, creating the license by, by, by creating bylaw that allows for it. But I think by having this in place, as soon as they do that, we're ready to sort of enact these and, and they have a frame of reference of what we're going to try to do. And so I think that's, it's sort of cart before the horse in some respects, but I think it's also uh, just shows that we've, we, we recognize the complexity, so we try to put it together a little bit in, in advance. Thank you. Yeah, I, th I think um, you know, especially if it was to replace the host community agreement, it would need town town council action anyway. But um, it would be certainly a several month uh, long process, at least, to get to get that through the town council and um, to confirm if the administration is is does want to go down that path. Um, so having a nice uh, a nice tight draft in place that can be um, expanded upon and kind of 
uh, put in more detail as um as it comes closer to full fruition, I think would be would be a good way to go. Right. And Doug, you're already working on language for the bylaw. Is that correct? Yeah, I put something kind of simple together for that. Right. I, mean, I think um, I think I've shared that with you, Steve. Right? I I don't know if you have or not. Actually, I can't remember if I did it or not either. I will, and then we can kind of reach out to to uh, Manny Joe and and sort of work through the process with the council. They've got a I believe the subcommittee is the GOL. I forget what it stands for. Government operations and something. I think which is one that deals with this. You know, sort of the bylaw creation stuff. I think that's the right way to go to, but that's where uh, you know we'll tap into uh, existing counselors and see what they think is best as far as you know going through their subcommittee and then full full council process. So we do have that as as next steps, but uh, yeah, I think we'll tidy this up a little bit more. So that's part of or we'll need to have ready. Okay, so. What was that? Can we just go back to that? The you put another number in there, and so the the current three has to do with the the current plan, and then four is going to be anything in the employment history, or and then do you want to expand that right now, or just wait a little bit? I think this would take some restructuring because I do okay. think we'd want to consider, um, you know, a how would we define the applicant? Because if they're spinning up, you know, separate LLCs for everything, I mean, if, right. it's, a, if it's a liquor kind of parallel, then it would be, you know, whether each we'd be looking at each person who's involved in the business. Right. Um, okay. And um, maybe we do want to move in that direction, but that's kind of how liquor catches is, you know, have you ever been involved in a, um, a business that had a, you know, a, a violation or something? Okay. Um, but it, it might be good to kind of disambiguate new applications where I think we'd have a, a pretty high, um, pretty high level of information required versus um, renewals where we would be looking at compliance and things. Okay. So I think, if, yeah, think about that. It probably would make some sense to split that out. Split them apart. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, this was just kind of a, just a little nitpick that, you know, if any inspectors or contractors or public safety needs to go in when the, the, um, the business is closed, they can actually do that. Um, yeah, Doug and I had a conversation about this one, and um, the idea was kind of loitering. Um, but this is kind of another another thing to look at with the licensed premises is uh, um, that you know if it's you know the the new red cardinal I believe it is that went into the the Kelly's building. It's, that's, mm -hmm. Yeah, then that somebody just standing outside of Kelly's would be, um, you know, could be caught up in this. So, um, you know, I think there could be. Could be something to having almost two definitions of the actual licensed premises, like alcohol, where it's sometimes not even the whole restaurant, or maybe a grounds type of thing. Mm -hmm. What's the what's the problem with gathering outside a? So, so I think the distinction you know, uh, that that the word loitering implies is sort of uh, uh, well, I, the, the thing we got to think about is like with COVID or just if they're busy. I mean, I think the Netta place in, in Northampton was so busy at the line out the door and into the parking lot. Well, you're gathered outside the place, but you're staying in line for the for the business. That shouldn't be problematic, really, other than just general safety kind of things. Whereas loitering implies, you know, you're hanging about for no particular reason. And so I mm -hmm. think that putting the word loiter in may be a little more specific to what where our attention is, is that you know, we don't want people just kind of hanging around causing trouble or potentially but if if they're you know if they have purpose for being there then that's that's not as problematic so right so i guess I, I still wonder what's the problem with loitering i i don't well, i don't really see it i don't i mean it seems i mean i, I remember i when i was practice law in springfield i was asked to kind of dig up all the parts of the general laws that could be used to harass homeless people and because the business district client didn't like them right and i mean you know it's a lot of first amendment yeah. violation and i mean i i just don't who cares if people are hanging around yeah i think the other the other thing that could we might put in there in, in that regard you know maybe loitering itself is not you know i always think of that as being uh you know in the eye of the cop yeah exactly well wants to harass somebody maybe it's maybe it's something that's more uh prescriptive relative to their you know to their actions or their or or their activities or something like that um yeah it's it's a tricky one i i agree i mean i think the idea is just you know it, it is a place I mean, and maybe the thing to do is look at if we have anything or if the state has anything relative to outside of bars or or um 
package stores, that kind of thing. I think the intent there is that you know you uh, uh, are trying to you know keep the place safe and functional and that sort of thing. Really, it's not about you know somebody enjoying the weather. <laughs> you know? uh, right. How about this approach? To what you uh, are suggesting, Doug? How about the the applicant tells us how they want to use outside space, and then we're kind of we decide whether to approve that. And then um, when we're renewing, then we check on whether the, the space was being used in that way. Or, so, you know, it's that kind of like, tell yeah. us how you want to use the space. Yeah. Yeah, that could be part of the management plan. So when we, we ask for sort of management plan, we could say, including exterior spaces. And, you know, we can just, in, in the sort of materials that Steve, in the conversations he has with, with the applicants, he could say, what we're looking for here is like, you know, does it bother you if there are people loitering? Then we want to, you know, or does it, or do you have intention of having, you know, table and chairs out there to people sit and not, obviously not partake because that's still illegal, but, but to, uh, you know, to uh, sit and relax because you've got a nice little green space and it's, you know, or whatever. So yeah, I think we could, we could put it, put something like that in a management plan and, and right. uh, kind of clarify that for sure. Wouldn't, wouldn't part of that involve the landlord, whoever owns the building, that discussion? Like, we obviously, like some of those places, they can do whatever they want once they're inside the door, but, you know, the curb. Yeah, I think there's a certain, then, you know. Especially in a, in a mall, like down at the, the Kelly's building. Yeah. You know, they, there are several stores there, which I. Yeah, I mean, I think that that would be probably a question we'd want to pose if they if they put something into their plan. You right. know, like, oh, have you checked with your landlord to make sure this is okay? And and you know, you know, I think that uh, the intention here in, in an application is we you know we want that proof that they have access to the property just like we do with a liquor license. So we have them you know share their lease. We can read through the lease and see what it says because a lot of times that'll be spelled out in their lease. Right. What they can't do so. Okay. Um, they can't run counter to their own lease. Okay. Great. Do we all do we all just agree? I, I think we should probably just take that sentence out altogether. Does anyone do, do we want to even keep language in there about loitering? Because I, I think we should just get rid of it. it sounds like we we deal with it at another time. You know, maybe we could just <clears throat> uh, just leave it in there with some note that we come back to it and change it. And and just as a placeholder for so that we know to address the issue. Is that everyone okay with that? Yeah, because uh, I would agree it may just come out of that location, but then nonetheless, uh, you know, be be mentioned or or maybe we leave a line that references, oh, your management plan should include, you know, your activation of outside spaces or something like that. Right. You know, um, so we'll, I mean, we'll have to. And just make sure that we, you know, talk if there's a landlord involved that we, right, we have that, that information out. also. Right. Okay. Wait. So it'll, if this is kind of just there to remind us in the next revision to address it elsewhere. Right, right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, one thing I should also mention that is in that uh, informal conversation with the finance director I had, he said that um, <laughs> social consumption does seem to be coming at one time or another, and it might be good to, to kind of have, you know, even if we don't have that specific section, those specific regulations to have it kind of future proof for that. Okay. I kind of misread this when I made the comment that I didn't see first there. So that I think that clarifies a lot of it. Um, but we might want to expand there um, kind of what uh, what that kind of assignment would be. Um, it's very spelled out with the state for alcohol. But um, you know, to my mind, if it was going to parallel that, it would almost be like another new full application. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I mean, certainly my intention was that like when there is a change of, of uh, assignment, you know that this this is parallels that same that same process in some respects. You know you can you can uh, yeah the transfer of a license from one you know of a liquor license from one person to another is not quite the full effort of a brand new license, but it's it's pretty close. So we want to I think we want to be cognizant of that is is the intent here. Let, let, let me ask you a question here because the um, I think they're the big companies have been trying to buy up right and I guess my um, say that say that again Steve I just said with a lot of success with yeah. a lot of success so I, I guess my concern is is this that um, I'd want the buyer the intended buyer to come to us before they've 
paid so that we don't have the pressure of um of having to feel like we're screwing up a deal i mean that's already happened right and i think that yeah and and, and that may have been what i intended by that single sentence uh, certainly that's my thought as well is that you know if if they're considering a change in, in you know a, a transfer of license um that the 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 new uh the new license holder would be vetted in the same way uh, or very similar way to uh, uh, a brand new license or uh, so i think that that's certainly the intent there and, and if we need to sort of you know bolster that a little bit I, you know that's that's you know appropriate i think yeah one, one thing i'd be interested to hear um hear your all hear your thoughts about this is that um all the uh, you know all, I've, all the transfers I've ever dealt with anyway. I mean, in liquor in liquor licenses, if you need to, um, even if there's a change of um, of stockholder, you know, something might be owned fifty percent by one person, fifty percent by the other, and um, that needs a a specific transaction. I don't think we've seen that too often because usually it's all or nothing. But um, that is a transaction you can do, and um, we don't have any publicly held uh, liquor licensees. But I wonder how they deal with that in towns where they might. You know, I know there's places where CVS or Walgreens has has a um has a liquor license and I, I mean i can't imagine if it's obviously impossible if you have a publicly held corporation to to be doing that kind of change of um of ownership form every time somebody buys or sells the stock yeah it's um it's curious i think um i think in those kind of large held companies like that i think it's it is uh i think i think what most places do is probably lean much more on the manager as far as determining whether or not they feel the proper structures are in place for the license. Um, uh, but, you know, again, I think that that. Yeah, corporate ownership is a, is a curious circumstance because, you know, it it. If uh, in, you know, in most cases, and even this is true for us in a liquor realm, they're more often, you know, modest sized you know companies they're not you know national organizations and that sort of thing and so it, it but that may not hold true in the marijuana realm um you know and that's that's a that's a pretty significant difference and so i i i think and, and steve you and i talked about this a little bit today when we, we spoke on this is just um whether or not the, the the state liquor laws sort of have you know uh uh thoughts or advice uh you know in, in and the state website has some thoughts about that kind of thing or, or procedural things that you do in those circumstances. Um, Cause there could be, you know, I mean, you think about like Big Y owns uh, Table and Vine in, in Northampton. That's a pretty big company. Um, you know, how is it that they, I mean, it may, it's still probably privately held, I would guess, but still, you know, there's a good chance that there's some uh, place in the Eastern Mass that's, that's like a liquor license where it's held by a, a sort of a national corporation, that kind of thing. And so how did those, uh, how do those get dealt with and how do they get managed in, in evaluating those and, and changes in ownership, quote unquote. So, right. yeah. Yeah. Gaston. I, I wonder if uh, maybe we can just kind of break out a new section 14, call it transfer of licenses and, and just kind of say to come, I mean, that we need to kind yeah. of work on it. Um, uh, because it, it it's 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 a it's it's a technical area and it's and we <laughs> it's kind of the kind of thing that um, the intended buyers are going to see how they can game whatever we've written. Uh, so we, I think we need to kind of think about it carefully. Yeah. 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 Well, I do think also, like like has been suggested, I think the likelihood of of larger you know economic entities for live term larger businesses are are likely to get into this uh and into these businesses um and have a you know i mean we had a franchisee tonight on our common vic you know um the parent companies are probably going to be um uh, even bigger and and you know significant players in in this market i think and so we need to be ready for that case okay um, so this comment here, um, 
Yeah, what what we were going for is really just something like a vote of the corporate board, uh, properly authorized and executed. Um, you know, that's that's what the uh, the liquor liquor licenses use for everything. It's always called a vote of the corporate board. I guess they don't really provide for sole proprietorship, but I think it's uh, tremendously unlikely we would ever see sole proprietorship for a marijuana retail business anyway. So, um, but I, I yeah, I, this is one of those where I was stealing from somebody else and and left it as as it was. But I think you know we can parallel the liquor law language there exactly if we choose to there okay now this i think was just um kind of whatever whatever doug took this from was just kind of poorly worded um the, the intention is to reference you know the mass general laws and then some specific laws related to, to marijuana and, and regulation related to marijuana, and then also mention the local bylaws and rules and regulations, and basically say, you know, you're responsible for behaving well within all of these different constructs that that apply, and we take that into consideration when we're when we're uh, when we're dealing with with you. Um, so it's a little it's a messy read for sure because um, it's sort of you know. Uh, when it references all those different sort of aspects of, 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 of law and regulation, and then adds a few more, it becomes a sort of overly difficult to read compound sentence. So I think we can, I think that's, I think the intent of it is just, we're gonna take this stuff into consideration and, and it's part of what we expect you to do is to abide by all the laws and regulations. Um, it's a matter of sort of, can we phrase that in a way that reads a little more easily? Yeah, I think it's kind of just a syntax thing, but we can probably clear that up pretty easily. Um, yeah, we had a conversation about this, and I think you said, Doug, that um, it would really be, um, you know, perhaps uh, you suggested Crest or the fire department might respond to things. Um, I don't really know. Um, I think public safety organization is is uh, is probably fine. I don't know how much Crest would ever be responding to kind of business. Um, yeah, I, I, I wasn't sure whether they would or wouldn't. And, and I think, you know, in the, in the conversations I've seen them have, they're, you know, they, they're working with police to sort of figure out how best to all interact, whether it come up in this circumstance, I don't know. But I certainly thought, oh, well, you know, fire or uh, even to some extent you could consider, um, you know, uh, health inspectors to be a public safety organization. So I want to leave it broad. I mean, that's why I use that language just to make it broader um and and uh, inclusive in case some case like you know uh like fire enforces things like um number of occupants and you know that kind of stuff and those are all public safety related um so that was the intent there yeah i think that makes sense i'd probably revert that change if people agree Now this is um, this is somewhere where the uh, the license premises uh, issue really comes into focus um, because if you take that the definition that we have now um, this would mean that Red Cardinal if, you know, let's say they're only open nine to five Monday through Friday um, if the if Kelly's burnt some toast on uh, Saturday morning and set off the smoke detector um, they would have to, the manager would have to reply submit it to the town manager and the LLA within 24 hours. Um, so I think both the um, that wasn't my intent, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I like to I try to read everything adversarially, so so nobody else will be able to. Um, but um, so I think I had a couple of concerns of this. I think um, I think we already discussed kind of paring down the definition of license premises to kind of remove some of those issues. Um, I also don't know if every um, every incident needs to be reported. I mean, I guess if license premises, we just take that to mean is inside the building. Um, I think that would probably be be fair. Uh, I think 24 hours is a uh, very quick turnaround, um, especially if um, you know somebody important's on vacation or something, and you know if there's just a false alarm or something. Yeah, uh, I think you know I think that you know the manager you know should be around or or you know delegate of the of the license be you know should be able to I, if we want to make it 48. I I'm not wedded to that. I just think. I think my intention here with this is that if something happens in or around your property that uh, 
that's concerning. But, you know, and, and whether something's going to have an interior, I think that's very unlikely because you've got staff right there. But I think there's, you know, if you start to have uh, activity immediately outside your, your facility, that is, uh, you know, problematic. Uh, you know, we want you to be aware of it. We want you, I mean, if you look at the host community agreement, there's a, there's a ton of stuff. Most of the uh, of, uh, host community agreements have a fair amount of language around um, safety and security around the location and, you know, the things that the, uh, the license, you know, the licensee or the host, you know, uh, 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 business is, is responsible for. And so it's trying to, to kind of parallel or track that, that piece. So we might be able to look at that. Some of the languages in our host community agreement to maybe refine this a little bit. But I think the intent was that, you know, if something happens, you need to make sure that uh, people are aware because that, you know, and, and if it becomes chronic, you know, the, I, I think about it in terms of like, if you're having chronic problems that are things that you as a business owner should be, um, you know, attending to, you know, we want to know that as, as we think about, you know, uh, are you a good, you know, neighbor to your, you know, and a good uh, corporate citizen within our community and, and we want to factor that in when we're, <clears throat> when we're uh, renewing licenses and that sort of thing. So that's the broader intent, I think, in, in putting something like that in. And, and again, you know, sort of borrowing some of these things from some other folks and looking at some of those host community agreements and the languages that's in those about safety and security of the premises. And, I, and, and it may be overly, uh, prescriptive or, or dramatic here. I think that, you know, the concern because of, of you know, this is such a, a change and there are a lot of folks that are still pretty uncomfortable with, with you know, light, you know, legalized marijuana is, is, you know, maybe not a concern to neighbors so much, but, but, you know, there are, I think, places and people that, that want to see a, a little refined uh, approach because uh, you know the nature of the of the of the product you know, in much the same way that you know alcohol has I mean you know if you look closely at, like if you want a tavern license uh, you know you have to have like windows that open and are visible we're well, not open but are visible uh, to the street um, I don't know if you guys have ever looked at that section of the law but but you know there are there are some really it's interesting and so it's you know uh, antiquated and but it, it 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 it's what you're seeing there i think in that sort of antiquated language of, of the alcohol stuff is is that concern like at the end of prohibition about um you know the, the difficulties that might you know come with a you know alcohol establishments and so i think that that's you know the intent here is to try to have some some way to kind of measure that but again we don't want to be you know we don't want to be a temperance movement sort of folks either so Dylan's got his hand. Yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, that, that, that idea of uh, approaching marijuana kind of like al alcohol after, um, after prohibition, I mean, do we think a lot of that was, was overblown? Or do we think that that was a good transition from prohibition to, to where we are now? Because I I think lesson learned with that one is I, I don't think we necessarily need to be as, as over the top strict with it, especially when we're talking about something like marijuana as opposed to alcohol. Yeah. Because I, I, I don't think I, I, I've seen it's it's been years, but I've seen people, you know, uh, throwing fists outside of McMurphy's years ago. I, I think we're going to see less of that uh, with something like marijuana. Um, to yeah. That. Yeah, I mean, I would, say, I would agree with you. And I think the other thing I would say is that some of this is about, um, you know, a, at least somewhat of a frame for those people that have some anxiety about it. So if the, if the public at a, at a, as a whole, you know, we, we sort of think in case of, in terms of worst case scenarios. So yeah. you know, even with alcohol stuff, we, we try to think about those things. So it's really about that, I think, for me. Well, I, mean, I, I mean, I guess I completely disagree with the idea that our job is to deal with people's anxiety unless it's reasonable anxiety. And I, uh, unless we're prepared to create a duty to file report for all the uh, package stores in town, uh, I, I just, you know, I, I disagree with having a requirement for retail cannabis that we don't have for retail alcohol. 
Um, and I suspect that if we tell all the um, liquor store, spirit house, et cetera, that they have this kind of duty to file a report, we're going to get an earful. And that's fine if that's if that's really the, the standard that we think is necessary. I, I don't know if there's any, um, if we can point to any single fact of something that's happened that warrants this. And um, so uh, I guess, number one, I don't think we're here to deal with unreasonable anxieties. And number two, uh, I don't think that there's any justification for a stricter standard for a cannabis retail establishment than an alcohol retail establishment. Yeah. I, oh, oh, Hallie, go ahead. Sorry. I was gonna say, I actually, not, I, I agree with Gaston and maybe the, what we start with is just with every renewal, part of that is a file with emergency services or a check-in with the police department to see if things have been called. Because I, I do think that this is vastly different than our alcohol regulations, which is fine, you know, but I'm afraid that we're gonna have a reputation then for being hard to do business with in town. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I I appreciate these comments. I mean, I, you know, I sort of put that in. I was again, I'm I was definitely leaning on some other communities and sort of things that they were doing and and thinking about this. And and I think that uh, you know the the intention here, uh, and I and I fully sort of understand and respect this. And it does beg the question: Should we, you know, if we're going to have something kind of like this, even if it's much more pared down than this, you know, should we have something similar outside of bars? Uh, or outside of uh, package stores or whatever. I mean, it, you know, sort of, I, I do think that's the case is that if we enact this for this circumstance, we certainly, you know, need to look at whether we need to do that somewhere else. I also think, you know, the, the uh, I think the intention behind this one in some respects was, was really about, you know, uh, putting some, some uh, onus on the, on the licensee to be and continue to be an active and, uh, you know, good faith neighbor and partner with the community around issues of safety. And I think that, you know, I think because, you know, uh, and I think that what may have driven this section from into, into some other people's sort of regulations was, was some concern that because it has formerly been, an, you know, an illegal activity, uh, they were worried that there may be, you know, a, a larger number of, of uh, you know, concerns with who might be there and they may want to operate in a way that that would be the case if it was still an illegal activity so i don't know i mean i i, I haven't heard it from any of those people if they yeah. you know they want to come to our meetings and tell us their concerns that we can yeah. hear them. no and i think i think we can take it out or, or or modify it much more significantly you know i think we want to think of it i i, I would suggest if, if something like this is in in place you know, and, and again, I think looking at like host community agreements sort of see what we have around the sort of safety and reporting kind of concerns within there, that may be sufficient and this doesn't need to be here at all. I mean, I've, I'm not, I'm playing, uh, some of what I'm doing here today is kind of playing devil's advocate because <laughs> I'm, I'm not, uh, I wouldn't say I'm, you know, like gonna follow my sword for this for any, by any, re, any measure, you know? Um, and I think there's some some thorny questions it raises. And so that's, that's good. That's, I'm glad we're having the, you know, a conversation about it. Okay, great. Um, why don't we keep going, Steve, and we can come back to that later. This is just a change I made to, um, I think this was taken from Hallie's uh, liquor license guidelines. I just made this in both of them that okay. could have more than three in a year or, or one year or three years, three years. Yeah. Um, and then fees, we would just, put that at the top to be consistent with formatting and everything else. Okay, great. So uh, what, so next up, Doug, you're just gonna go over it again and yeah, look at the changes that, and think about the, what we discussed about the reporting section yeah, and all that. that, yeah. There's some really, you know, some helpful and, and useful sort of feedback on, on some of these points that, that, you know, seem rather benign when you sort of glance at it, but then you start thinking a little more deeply about them and it's like, well, wait a minute, this starts mm. to have some, ripple effects and, and unintended consequences that we want to, uh, you know, we don't want to over-regulate because that's just an untenable situation for us as well as the owners. And, and I think it gets to Ali's point, we've become you know, sort of business unfriendly. Um, you know, I think we, we do this role, you know, serve as a, as a 
uh, sounding board for you know thinking about those things that can go badly and what does that mean and what 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 and how do we want to react to that as a community um and so it's you know there's a balance to be struck between things and so this has really been super helpful and and i'll go back with steve we'll go through these uh, again and see if we can kind of nuance it a bit and and uh and like i say you know like on that duty to, to file i mean i'll look at at what what's in our post community agreements now um see what we've already sort of framed as a requirement of people and and uh see if that may give us a little guidance about that and and then i think also thinking of that in context of of our liquor, liquor licensees as well um because we don't want to be burning one versus the other unnecessarily i think that's unfair and 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 really unnecessary because i think you know uh it it, it doesn't serve serve us well in the long run all right thanks gaston and I just want to go, uh, Steve made a comment about like trying to anticipate the social use. And I, I guess I, I'd, I'd like to suggest that we not try to get ahead of things too much. I, I think that the kind of structure that Doug has drafted here will make it easy to adapt to, to social use. But I think it's very hard to kind of guess at um, how the laws are going to come down and and where we need to worry about. So I I would suggest we, we try to make this exactly right for retail. And then we've got a starting point to make adaptations for, for social use when it comes our way. I think that's a very good point. Yeah, who knows what's yeah. going down the pike. Yeah, I do too. Thanks. Yeah, if I may just add a little to that. I'm, I'm, I was hopeful it, that it would be uh, at least a starting place and that that way if it gets enacted in sort of, you know, as was the case with with adult use, it kind of rolled out before everybody was really, really ready. So at least this gives us a, a frame and and some framework from which to operate. There's obviously some some particulars that will need to be thought through, and that'll depend on to guess the point, guess on point, you know, sort of what and how the the legislature enacts it and what they you know require or don't or that sort of thing. But I think this hopefully will give us you know a a, a frame that's still functional for us at the start. Okay. Great, thanks, Doug. Okay, so what is next on the agenda? We have rental registration. Oh, are we doing this one today? Does anyone have anything on this? Are we? No, we don't have anything yeah. new. Okay, all right. So forget about that. Lunch cart regulations. Where is still the draft is still in process. Yeah, so I met with um, the uh, finance director and the uh, collector today, actually, about the parking issue at three o'clock. Oh, great. Um, and um, they were pretty open to um, a number of different um, approaches. Um, they said that um, in, in other cases, there are like a, the funeral home and the church, I believe, has um, they pay some fee and they actually get the bags you can put over the meters to um, to reserve them. And um, that would be an option if people were looking to reserve spaces. Um, but I think that comes back to the entire question of do we allow for spaces to be reserved, which um, right. I lean pretty strongly towards no, but I'm definitely open to counter arguments on that. Um, and um, they also said that, you know, probably the easiest thing would be that they just have to feed the meter and um, parking enforcement will have to keep up with them on that. Um, they could also potentially, I brought up the idea of um, we get these uh, town employees, um, certain town employees get these um, kind of uh, laminated placards that you put in your dashboard that you, you know, inspectors use them if they're on a job site or something and they have to park in a space and, um, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, you don't have to pay for it because you're in the, the line of duty, so to speak. Um, and something like that, you know, maybe they pay. Oh, you've got one. Cool. Oh, Doug has one. <laughs> and yeah, maybe you pay, uh, you know, 250, 300 bucks. I don't know what the number would be, but some some fee a year. Uh -huh. And then you have that. Um, and I guess you have to make sure they're not just using it to to go to the bars at the weekends or something. But um, but uh, that could be an option, too. Um, and prepaying, you know, a month in advance would be would be an option. But I think um, that would probably be be challenging with the kind of more flexible approach we're taking um but um that's that's the the feedback i got so i will um yeah try to collate that and um get our comments and have a uh, a nice complete draft for us next time all right super great thank you so lots to look forward to um okay license fee comparison guest on here we yes go. okay so uh <laughs> so I, I i put in some hours and and did some analysis i guess uh um uh Steve, maybe you can put up the document that has the title of, of analysis. 
I, I, I would suggest if you all can also maybe open the, the spreadsheet on uh, your computers. Um, what I did was try to actually put the same, the corresponding fee for different towns on the same line of the spreadsheet so we could see the differences. And what that demonstrates is that we are indeed, you know, very much more expensive than our neighboring communities, um, in some cases by a lot. Uh, so, you know, that raises a general question about do we want to uh, lower fees? And if so, what's the principle? I, I want to kind of pause that we can come back to it. What I'd like to actually spend a few minutes talking about is um, what other towns are doing that we don't do at all and some distinctions that they draw, which we might consider relevant and useful in calibrating our, our fee structure. So um, in terms of other licenses, um, uh, and, and I, I definitely appreciate any feedback from you, from I think maybe Steve and Doug are the ones who, who may have some other uh, knowledge here than, than um, what I could gather just from reading the, the fee schedules. Um, but a number of towns have seasonal all alcohol licenses and we, we seem to only have seasonal wine and malt. So, you know, just raises a question, who would be the potential applicant I don't know, I assume that, is there an unlimited quota for seasonal all alcohol licenses? Does anyone have any knowledge about that category? Um, I can say about seasonal, I don't really know anything about the distinction between all alcohol and wine and malt off the top of my head, but I didn't think it was restricted to wine and malt. I guess that's not really something I had considered, um, but I do know seasonal licenses are generally intended for, um, you know, we kind of have an inverse busy and, uh, and uh, and slow season than all the vacation towns in the Cape and everything. And I think that's what seasonal is really made for is, you know, Falmouth or Chatham or things like that, where, um, you know, it just, people don't, don't run all the restaurants during the winter and um, they are that without a quota, there is no quota for seasonal. Um, I could be wrong with this, but I do remember talking to somebody in Northampton and um, they have a couple off quota licenses, which we'll get to, but I believe one of the ways to get to there is to, um, have a seasonal license for one year and then you can convert it into an off quota license if whatever conditions are are in place are, are set which i'm not entirely certain of but um the only seasonal license we have is uh the town's own cherry hill um it doesn't really fit amherst very well but but um it is it is a pretty pretty long period of i think at april to the end of november yep Doug? if i may just talk about seasonal license i think that's you know like you say at the cape uh, where it's a vacation driven sort of economy in, in that area. I think also, I think there's a lot of golf courses around that, that are like our golf course that have a seasonal license. Um, we actually, uh, Amherst Golf Club at the Amherst College is also a seasonal license or it has been, they may have, may have converted to, to full license. Um, I think it, in just back to your thing about sort of having a seasonal license then converting to a, uh, to a, you know, sort of non quota or above quota license, I think Anytime you go above quota, you need an act of legislature. But I think by being a seasonal operator, you demonstrate that you're, you know, a good citizen of your town, and therefore gives the legislature a little more comfort in allowing an extra license in the community. Mm -hmm. and that's what I would suggest there. I think it still requires, you know, formally to if you have a uh, if 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 the uh, if a town needs to to go above their quota, they actually have to get an act of legislature to to get that uh, that extra license. And so I think that you know. Those seasonal licenses that can be converted are, are probably, you know, you've demonstrated that you're a good, you know, that it's not a burden on the town. It's a necessary, you know, uh, uh, what's the term that they use? Uh, sort of uh, uh, a need is being met um, kind of circumstance. So. so I guess one question would be, if we had a seasonal all alcohol, would um, Cherry Hill be inclined to go that way i i mean i'm i'm totally ignorant about it um i can't speak for them i'm not a golfer yeah i kind of doubt it but okay um so okay no go ahead i was just going to ask you know the thing is is that you know on short-term licenses you have to be a non-profit to have an all alcohol license which i've always thought is a little of a curious sort of thing that if you're for profit you can't serve all alcohol but if you're a non-profit you know have at it um a short-term license that that may also apply uh with seasonal is that that because that's it i think if i'm correct you know and steve you can correct me if i'm wrong but i think that 
that limitation on on short term licenses being uh, all alcohol only allowed for nonprofits is in state law, correct? Yes. Yeah. Which is a I think okay. a whole different um, thing, but it may also yeah. may also apply to the. I would think it might apply to the to the seasonal one, so it would have to be a non. They'd have to be declare themselves a nonprofit to do that. Okay. Okay. I'm not sure. I'll, That's I'll, I'll look. I'll look into that. Um, what many towns had is like a farm slash winery pouring license, and I think what's relevant is that it's um, uh, seemed to be significantly less expensive than our hundred dollar licenses, and so I, I I guess I'd be inclined um, to uh, to charge these winery farms less than the hundred bucks to do an event. Um, so. If I can interject there, Gaston, I actually had to do a, a deep dive on this for for somebody a, maybe a month ago. Um, so um, there's that that's a special category. You know, uh, Massachusetts has the three tiered system of um, liquor liquor uh, regulation, where there's the uh, manufacturer, the distributor, and the and the um, the, the uh, retailer. And um, I think in 2014 there was a law that allowed for farmer breweries and farmer wineries to be created, which are the, the, you know it's kind of why they said this explosion of the small scale. Yeah. Um, you know the Wachusett type, um, uh, what's the one in uh, Fort Hill, those types of things, uh, yeah, yeah. New City. And um, the farmer winery or farmer brewery pouring permits allows them to, um, so they get they get licensed through the state um, and the and the ATF to um, to do the brewing activity. And the, the local town doesn't have anything beyond zoning, but then um, they can get a pouring permit, which allows them to actually serve on um, on their site. And that's what that is. So that's an addition to all their, it's, it's restricted just to that class of, um, state licensed farmer breweries or farmer wineries. Well, but um, I'll just point out that uh, I check which town it is, but that has like for the this category, $50 per event. Per event, that's very strange. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, so uh, I guess we can try to make sense of it and, and see if that's something that's available to us. Um, let me see which, if I can point out one that had that. Um, uh, we do actually, I'm, I'm very curious to see which one has that, but as you're looking, we do actually have a, um, the, uh, Amherst farm winery actually holds that license and it's never been on our, yeah. our feed chart for some okay. reason, but, um, Greenfield. Um, so if you, you know, I'll, I'll go, but this would be in the license fee compare comparison word document. I'm going to go to Greenfield. And if, um, what they have is in off, uh, off premise, actually, it's an off-premise license, farmer winery at agricultural event, fifty dollars. Hmm. That um, could be that could be akin to our um, the uh, the uh, the farmers market ones we do. Okay. I'm not even sure if we charge for those. Okay. Um, well, so let me go into some of the distinctions that are out there because, again, if as we're thinking of changing fees, we might want to take advantage of some of these distinctions. Cambridge, city of Cambridge, charges a lot more for a new licensee than for a renewal. Um, like way more, like, you know, 7,000 versus 4,000, some that kind of difference. Um, Northampton, if you're a, you know, package store, they charge significant, you know, noticeably more if it's over 5,000 square feet, so by size. Um, uh, Hadley, uh, this one I really like actually. Um, Hadley charges for-profit businesses that want a short-term license much more than nonprofits. Um, I'd be inclined to kind of go along with something like that. If you're doing a short-term license and you're in it for the money, <laughs> we should get we should get more of it than mm -hmm. if you're a nonprofit just trying to have an event. Um, uh, Salem has. Um, some licensees that uh, that are six day versus seven day of the week. I guess they still have like a, an old blue law, no Sunday sales and they charge, you know, a, a noticeably less. Huh. Um, uh, what several towns charge different amounts for wine and malt restaurant versus uh, what do I meant what is, right what there? Is I meant to, I think I meant to have common, wait, what, what was I? Club, sorry, versus club. Club. We have we have the same fee for clubs and restaurants for wine and malt. Um, uh, a number of towns charge more to restaurants than clubs, which makes sense to me mm -hmm. uh, as well. Um, 
Okay, we talked about the seasonal already. Um, another way of, I, I guess, segmenting the market for the short-term license, Cambridge charges more for a short-term license event that has more than 100 people. Um, uh, okay, I don't know what Northampton's wine and malt special license is. Um, I guess that's just a question. Um, they also have pouring permits. I don't know exactly what that refers to. It's a different price than everything else. Um, Cambridge happens to have a malt only. So they've got malt and wine and also malt only, um, uh, which costs less than the wine and malt. Um, a puzzle that uh, I called Steve about and, and we didn't really figure out is why Holyoke has different price points for common victuallers and restaurants. Um, what that distinction is, we weren't really sure about. Doug, I don't know if, if you can make sense of that one. Maybe that's, you know, the, the, the difference between, uh, you know, the, the hot dogs at, uh, at Cumberland Farms <laughs> and, and the beer that they might sell versus, uh, you know, versus an actual sit down restaurant kind of place. Okay. I'm guessing. Yep. Okay. Interesting. Um, uh, I don't think this is may be relevant in Amherst, but um, Cambridge charges more for a hotel license depending on the number of rooms. So more than 100 rooms and it's uh, considerably more expensive. Um, Cambridge also has a separate category of um, educational licenses. Um, when you look at it closely, you see the only difference is that they don't um, try to gouge you the first year um, on the educational license, but the renewals are the same amounts as, um, as other licensees. So, um, I don't know, based on these various distinctions and the fact that we are generally more expensive, I wonder if you got any ideas or you have any questions to, to think about it. I mean, I guess my purpose today was just to try to lay out some of the facts and different approaches that are out there so that we can rethink ours um, and not be limited by what we currently have in place. Doug? So um, a couple of things. First, I'll ask a, a quick question on the educational license for Cambridge. Does that mean like on on campus, those licenses on. I think yeah, I think it's it's for university. Okay. Licenses. Yeah. So they're they're thinking about them as less in it for the profit than than say yeah. just a bar down the street. I mean, the I only difference is just that first year, actually. Yeah. 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 If I had to hazard a guess, I remember when we were first, uh, and I think in our first year here, when we were looking at um, the short term licenses, we were kind of looking at a way to get UMass. It. Like there's section 14, which is the short term uh, section, has the provision for kind of a long term, short term. Kind of a, a standing short-term license for educational institutions and we didn't end up pursuing it but i wonder if that's where that is i mean if there was any town or city in the commonwealth that did it would probably be cambridge yeah i think that that's yeah. right that that rings a bell in my head too steve um the other thing i think and i, I just want to pose this as you know i've been thinking about this a little bit just in, in general around fees and so i think we want to think about and, and i think the rationale is different for different kinds of licenses we're talking most about alcohol ones here it's like you know what is our intention behind this this license fee. In other words, are we, um, you know, are we, I mean, a, a piece of it is we're trying to generate a little revenue for the town to cover, you know, staff time. Um, and are we thinking, oh, in, in certain circumstances, you know, the likelihood of, of something more expensive, like, you know, police activity, et cetera, happens. And so we're going to charge more for those, those licenses. Um, and I think, you know, the, I think, Perhaps the other rationale, certainly around liquor licenses in Amherst, is because of the large student population, um, and you know, and the, the sort of perceived a real risk, you know, with younger uh, consumers of alcohol and underage drinking, that that we sort of you know uh, ask people to commit on a on a serious level because we have more um, overall, you know. Uh, things we have to deal with as a community because of that. Um, so we have, you know, more police activity, not just, you know, not just specifically at, you know, sort of the bars and that sort of thing, but in and around, you know, the community related to alcohol. And so we're trying to kind of make ourselves whole, but also, you know, ask of those people that, you know, they, they we're gonna ask you for a lot of money because we want you to, you're, you're likely to do well financially here. And also, um, you know, uh, we want you to be a serious partner with us in, in, in our community. So I think those are all factors, but I think, you know, what's our intention with these fees? 
is one of the questions we need to kind of pose ourselves as we think about how to set them and, and how we compare to other communities. That, that makes sense to me that um, in some ways it's kind of like an infrastructure fee for what the town needs, you know, just like they need to do more inspections of these um, uh, apartments for students in a way the, the kind of the, the restaurants with liquor licenses are helping pay for that um, in, in a sense. Um, the other side of it, I mean, I, like with the for-profit businesses doing a short-term license, I, I see that as kind of profit sharing being part of the, the, the rationale. I mean, maybe that, you know, whether that's a legitimate rationale, I, um, we can discuss, but I, I, I don't have a problem with it myself. Yeah, I think that's a very good idea um, for a for-profit business to have a higher fee. Um, does anybody, did you go into any, So, because I, I, I do see the rationale behind charging a higher fee for a liquor license in Amherst just because of everything that is involved and we do want some kind of commitment from that they're going to take it seriously because of all the other issues involved. And did you uh, do any historical work or uh, check to see when the, the mo that fee has been most recently set or updated? Gaston, no, I, I, no? I, I, I'm, to be honest, I, I I'm not, um, I don't even know how to, how to do, um, does the town even, you know, I, I haven't, I love archives, but I haven't gotten into the, right, the town offices archives to try to see that kind of stuff. I'm just wondering how recently it was, you know, it was changed. I, I mean, Doug, you may remember. Do you remember, Doug? Was that I don't recall, you know, I don't recall the select board taking that up for, you know, certainly not while I was on it. So that, I mean, you know, you sort of consider we've been, been with a new form of government for, for three years plus, you know, you kind of go back. So it, it's, it's been a long while since we've changed our rates okay. um, around alcohol licenses. So we set them pretty high whenever we last set them, which might have been, you know, 2014, 2015. Okay. Um, but you know whether that's formally recorded anywhere so we can actually kind of figure that out i don't even right know. i was just curious i was um so we might want to so you're thinking guest on that we for the uh short term alcohol to split that off at some point and i i mean that's you know or, yeah you know with, there's a trade-off between complication and whatever other principle we have but personally right. i would be um uh, i mean in a sense it's also like in encouraging for-profit businesses to make some money with short-term licenses is part of the spirit of charging more and as, right. as I see it. Um, uh, um, that we we're happy to take the time on those because um, we're kind of promoting that sort of activity and, and uh, the town is getting paid for it in, in a certain sense. Um, I mean, I just, I guess the thing to notice uh, if you go to the spreadsheet is that every other town is way less except for i'm just looking now at all alcohol restaurant to use that as a kind of a benchmark hadley's the same every other town is way less except for cambridge which is a, a 500 bucks more so um i mean i again i think that um that that the explanation that doug, doug gave for that kind of difference is makes sense and i think it's justifiable but I guess the question is, um, where do we want to try to um, be more encouraging to the businesses by tinkering with the fees? Is there a place where right. it's particularly painful that we can um, that we don't need to, you know, we can make it less painful? Um, and it's hard for me to know that without talking to to to, to businesses. Right. Steve, have you heard any, like in dealing with uh, the business owners, any complaints or? Um, I mean, I would say universal grumbling for everybody in the uh, right. on-premises restaurant <laughs> category. Um, I mean, I think they just kind of accept it as a, a fact of life, but um, that certainly doesn't mean it can be adjusted. I mean, one thing that's always really stood out to me is the massive delta between the all alcohol and the wine and malt categories. Right. Um, so you can cause a lot of trouble on just wine and malt. Yeah, that is true. Yeah, Doug. Go ahead. I just say we we just need to raise that wine and malt a lot higher up. Right, I know. But actually, you know, to be a, a little more serious, you know, I think an interesting data point that that I think about and talk about this is that you know it would be it would be interesting to know whether the sort of volume of sales 
in uh, in Amherst, in and around alcohol, you know how they compare. And I don't know if there's any way to get this data because the thing is, is if we have uh, you know a higher volume of alcohol sold because of college age, you know, or whatever, you know, events at the university, uh, you know, you think about it, you know, the athletics, uh, you know, facilities and that sort of thing. You know, if we're if if we're a community where it generates a lot more revenue for those businesses, then, then it makes sense to charge more for those licenses in some ways, because they're going to make it back pretty easily and pretty quickly. And we know we have associated uh, things that we have to do around uh, enforcement and, and uh, you know, and, and uh, issues of, of, you know, parties that get out of hand and that kind of thing. Um, but if it's not, if, if it's not such that the sales are, you know, noticeably different than, you know, Northampton sales in, in their locations or, or other communities around us on a sort of per capita basis, uh, then, then I think it, it, it sort of begs a, a little bit of a question is like, are we placing an undue burden? But I don't know if we can get any of that kind of data. And I don't know if our, if our you know, it could be a thing we could, you know, kind of pose that question to our, to our licensees and sort of see what that volume is. And I'm, I'm sure there's some probably, you know, you know, statewide or regional or national, you know, sort of uh, metrics on that kind of sales per, you know, square foot per capita or something that we compare to. Because I think if, if, if we are a lot higher, then I think, you know, there's a, there's another defensible rationale for having a higher fee for those, for those licenses. Um, if we're, if we're not, if we're not really selling more alcohol than anybody else, you know, then I think it's harder to make that, that case. Right. I mean, we should also factor in, and I know we talked about this before, the cost of any public services um, attached to any mischief that comes out of such such things. Yeah. I'm sorry, Dylan. I was just going to say, I, I, uh, I mean, maybe for a nonprofit, I could see splitting it off, but I won't be swayed to to lower any fees on any of the for-profit bars. I know uh, I'm not going to name any names of, of businesses, but I know a lot of them are owned by multiple owners. And I've, I've seen the uh, pictures of the homes of some of the owners who don't have another enterprise and they've never set foot in the building, but they own it. And it's like, damn, apparently owning a bar that you never work at or go to is uh, it's the way to go. I think they, I think that <laughs> one of the multiple people who, who are, are, are in this, I think they can afford the $3,500. Like, I think at the end of the day, maybe, maybe the rest of the towns, they're all just suckers for not charging more. Right. Maybe we should go up. That could be true. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, I'd be curious about we could maybe raise the wine and malt and reduce the all alcohol kind of proportionally and see how that does. Because I think, you know, whoever mentioned that you can get, I think Dylan, that you can get into a lot of trouble or Steve with wine and malt too. I mean, I think. That, that is very true. So, I, I guess I kind of f following on Dylan's comment, I um, I'd be um, inclined to consider differentiating restaurants from bars, so that the um, like an all alcohol, uh, 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 what do we call it, general on premises is higher than an all alcohol restaurant. I don't know if if that makes any sense to anyone else oh yeah no that would that's that's a good idea now was there did you have one in here where they a town does that i can't remember i was looking for it oh um uh let me see that they charge less for a restaurant that has a bar in it than just no you know what I, I i don't uh i don't think i saw um in fact i think a lot of towns don't even differentiate on the fee schedule between um the bars and restaurants okay I was thinking the same thing, Gaston. That kind of um, almost brings us right full circle to our old situation before we got rid of the uh, the food requirement, where people would be making these fake tiny kitchens to to qualify as a restaurant. Um, I guess at a certain level of investment and a certain level of kitchen quality, we demand um, it wouldn't be worth it for them not to just pay the the the, the difference. But um, it's nothing nothing is new in the world. It, yeah, it doesn't repeat, but it rhymes. Oh, uh, well, um, so obviously I didn't even touch anything besides alcohol because there's enough to, to, to chew on here. Um, what do, um, uh, I mean, I'm happy to kind of 
think through and maybe put like characterize a few different ways that we could go and 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 kind of put that before us and and talk about it further right? what what do you all see as the next steps here I'd, I'd love to run this by the finance director gaston i think he'd um he'd have some good thoughts and um you know probably probably a good person to talk to before any any radical changes but um i think he'd be uh he'd be very happy to see this so i'll send that along to him for sure dylan you you had you Oh yeah, Dylan. I was gonna say I could I could definitely get on board. Um, not not splitting bars from restaurants, but splitting profit uh, enterprises from nonprofit. Oh, definitely, yeah. Charging a lower fee there. Um, I I could also uh, get on board with with raising um, wine and malt uh, up a little bit, but bring the prices down anywhere for 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 profit enterprises. I'm not saying we have to raise them anywhere, but bring them down anywhere. I I can't get on board with that. These are are very profitable businesses in a, in a town that is very profitable for it. You know, you don't have to drive. You have to drive if you want to go grab a drink in Hadley. Students can all walk to the places up here in town um, and even in, in other sections of town. So many students live in those areas that it's all walking distance to um, a large uh, drinking population of folks. So I, uh, I, I could say stay the same, go up. Um, but yeah, the only the only area I'm on board with lowering it would be for nonprofits or or yeah, charity organizations, things like that. Okay. Okay. So um, maybe maybe the next um, uh, step would be to actually get the feedback from the finance director, and that can kind of inform that that side of the equation, kind of principles relating to town finances, and then we can kind of connect it to our our other ideas of relevant principles. Okay, sounds good. All right. All right. Thank you, Gaston. Yep. Um, any other yeah, questions? This was fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, it's really yeah. good. Okay. On to guidelines, regulations for liquor licenses. And everybody has a draft, most current draft of that one. Uh, Steve emailed it. Yes. Right before the meeting. I'm pulling that up here, so we don't need to dig it out. Um, oh, great. Okay. Yeah, so I had a, um, a conversation with Hallie today, too, and um, really just a couple tweaks. Um, just um, just kind of change this to, to fit with our other definitions formatting. Um, and I also, as, we, as I was going through this, I... Um, I just kind of flag some things that um, that are in here that would be a change from our current practices, um, just because I think um, as a whole these guidelines are, are are really great and really strong. But I wanted to make sure we we kind of recognized um, everything that was that would be changing as opposed to just what's kind of formal formalizing and um, and laying out what we already do. Um, so maybe I'll just run through it real quickly and then we'll kind of go back through any of the the controversial things to discuss. Um, so one thing I pointed out was that. Um, Requiring TIP certification for manager and serving staff would be a change. We do require TIP certification for short-term licenses and people who serve at short-term license, licensing events, but we do not require them um, at all for, for on-premises um, or, um, or off-premises. And actually thinking about this, I wonder if we should think about if that would, that would apply to off-premises. Um, and um, this, this we, uh, we discussed, we just kind of I think uh, if we if we put any or all in there instead of just all, I think that reflects our current practice. Where in certain situations we do ask for it. Um, this was just some some uh, housekeeping there. Um, a full time manager. I think um, that's kind of what I guess the ABCC says in a way. But I think it is an interesting thing to think about. How much do we expect from the managers? Because I think there are some of them who are you know actually you know quasi sole proprietors and they are every single day seven days a week and are some that who I don't know if they ever actually go there and it's pretty much just on paper. So it's interesting to think about if there's some kind of requirement we would put on. Um, Alice suggested uh, deleting that because it's already in in the um, ABCC regulations. Um, server training requirement, the tips, that type of thing, uh, that again would be a change. Uh, another thing I pointed out that uh, if the board did want to require that, then um, it would also probably be pretty difficult for um, most applicants to to provide anything from they probably wouldn't have servers hired up at the time they're um they're applying for the liquor license um you know for example protocol and, and the oyster bar theirs just actually came back from the abcc and they still have a couple months of construction ready to go um there was some change with this about um 
this was just kind of different. I know, I think last year or the year before, we changed the language in our um, on the license itself to reflect um, th this kind of timetable as opposed to this one. And Hallie said it would be fine just to swap that in um, unless people want to feel like we should bring that topic up. Um, this we were just kind of considering, you know, what would what what would prompt that? What would um, you know the posting of detailed officers? What would prompt that? What would um, what we you know? What point would that be done? That be done in response to discipline, or would that be done proactively for some kind of event? Um, that type of thing. Um, and then for this, um, only offenses which have occurred within three years preceding the date of the violation shall be used in calculating the number of offenses for the purposes of disciplinary guidelines. Uh, I think that's a good thing to think about. Is does that mean? Um, each is each charge a previous offense, or is each incident leading to charges a previous event? Because, for example, with Hazel's, I think they had six, um, three or six counts of, of serving a minor, and that mean they automatically go to three offenses, or would that be um, three incidents leading to an offense? So that that should be easy to clear up, but that's something to think about. Um, and then this would be that um, if there's a, a, a license suspension, um, restaurants or other businesses that sell food um, can't continue to serve even food without alcohol without the approval of the board, which um, that would be a new condition. We suspended Porta's license. Um, we didn't, um, we, they, they continue to serve food. And um, I know when the ABCC suspends a license, there's nothing about food there too. I don't know if we need to suspend the common Vic at that point. Uh, KP Law didn't point out anything about it, but um, that's what came to mind with me anyway. So um, I guess we can, now that we've gone over it, I guess we can just kind of jump through those issues. I think this um, this is a really tremendous draft, how I put it together and it's pretty much ready to be adopted with a couple um, formatting tweaks and kind of thinking about these issues. So uh, I guess the first one, the big one is um, requiring TIP certification for manager and all servers. That would be definitely a change. We, we require for managers, right? I mean, or, I or, or equivalent. So. Yes, was that yes? It's not required? I don't believe so. I could be wrong, but I don't. I don't believe so. I think it's I, just required for the man manager on the alcohol license right now. Manager. Okay. For a short term, yeah. For short term licenses, it's definitely required. Right, but, but for, it's not for an establishment. No. Why is that? We, really? We had it as a. We've re requested it though, right? Yeah, we we strongly we, recommend. Yeah, maybe we just start with the manager having to have it but it, i mean i i've been tip certified to do a fundraiser for the jones library i mean it's not that hard to do yeah was it useful no oh, sorry was it useful uh, i mean it was common sense kind of i mean it took like two hours i did it online at my own pace i mean i think if it's something we want to require i would partner with gabrielle and see if you know we could just do some classes for free for employees in town. I don't know. So, yeah, didn't Doug? What I would suggest, I, I don't, I, I kind of like the idea of having everybody tip certified. I think, you know, or, and, uh, you know, obviously if, you know, tips changes its name or thing changes, we'll have to modify, but I don't think it's a bad thing. I think the thing, would, if we want to put that in, and I, I would say I'm okay with that. Um, I think the thing we would want to do is, because um, as to Steve's point, is like they wouldn't necessarily have all their staff in place. Is is set a, a time frame in which they need to have all staff tip certified, and then of course you know on renewal we need them to sort of produce evidence that everybody's tip certified. So I think it becomes this sort of other piece uh, of reporting, you know, because otherwise you know you can say oh everybody needs to be tip certified, but if you don't ever check, then they're never going to necessarily do it. I mean, they just won't be diligent about it. So I think if we put that in, then I think we need to think about well, what are the sort of mechanics of checking on this at least somewhat periodically um, to, to see if they're being compliant with that. And, you know, if we feel it's it's worthwhile for people to do and, and it adds value and, you know, uh, makes for better, you know, uh, service and, and, and uh, you know, safer uh, alcohol service, then, you know, I think we just have to put those other pieces in in place as, as part and parcel of that. And again, try not to be too onerous with it and, and reasonable time frames for people to to become compliant or at least, you know, uh, uh, share their information with us. And, you know, th that would be the suggestions I'd make relative to that. Um, Gaston? 
I mean, it's, it's a bit expensive, right? It's like a hundred bucks. Is that right? Uh, when I did, I think it was like 75, but that's why, I mean, if we'd be happy to sponsor it. I mean, I, yeah. I think I, I like the idea personally of one person who's uh, at all times be tip certified. Yeah. I think that that gives some level of accountability. The manager, right? Yeah, yeah. but the manager is not always there. So maybe we change the term to an on-premises manager or on-site manager. Right. Yeah, I think I didn't realize it was that expensive to do the class because that is, is that's a bit more of a burden, you know, um, on, on on folks and, and or a business to take on. So that's yeah, that's true. Yeah, I, that I think so, and especially because um, sometimes staff tend to come and go. Right. Uh, yeah. It's, yeah. Ellen, you're you, you've been doing bartending. What's your take on this? Yeah, I mean, it's it's definitely going to be a cost that gets pushed onto the employees. When I had to do mine, you know, I had to pay for it. I wasn't reimbursed for it. Um, oh wow. So yeah, it's one of those things. Do I am I really going to fight about you know what ended up being you know less than a hundred dollars that kind of thing? So if we do that, it, it's essentially just going to be I think a tax on employees. I like the idea of it. I think it was it wasn't a total waste of time. I think maybe 15 minutes out of it was helpful as opposed to, you know, maybe the two hours. Um, but I think it's good to have somebody, at least one person on there, because as long as one person's done it, you know, they can be, uh, you know, Johnny Trivia with the uh, with the information they can throw out there. Like, well, actually, you know, it's mm -hmm. this yeah. rule on it. So, but, so one, is the tips... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, no, no. I mean, I was just gonna say one person at all times, Dylan, or just or the manager who's the official manager. It could be uh, whatever, whoever's acting as the manager. I think anyone who wants to be, you know, a, a supervisor, a requirement of that would be, you know, do do the tip certification class. Um, and then I think you're gonna get uh, if, if they're gonna make someone a manager, then that the business will much more likely take on the cost of that because they know they're this is somebody who's not gonna leave them in two months rather than a business being like, all right, tip certification. Oh, and you're gone. Cause you know, the restaurant yeah. industry. Right. Um, and I, and I know a lot of restaurants, even though they're not required to, they'll, they will make their staff do that. Cause it's, yeah, just the, I think it's a liability issue. The, the more steps you've taken to, as a precaution to <laughs> the violations, if you get in trouble, you'd be like, well, Hey, we did mandate all of our staff do this. And then we ended up with someone who's a bad apple. I don't know, um, but I don't. I don't think it's necessary to make all serving okay. staff do it, uh, at least on our end. Okay, so let's take that out. I'm happy to. Okay. The whole thing. I, I would say um, for the manager or anyone acting as manager, however you want to word that. Right. I would agree with that, that, that somebody on staff should be tip certified mm -hmm. at any time, I think would be a good kind of medium, sort of middle ground for that, I agree. And how does that work, Dylan? I've never worked in that industry, but if, you know, I, a lot of places, you know, maybe not the Stackers McMurphy's type, but, you know, it's the quiet place late at night, you know, right before close, rest, restaurants especially, would, would there always be like a manager on duty or would it be kind of like just a senior you know, there's, uh, I, I've never worked in a restaurant where you don't have a manager on duty. Um, even, even if there was no liability issue, no restaurant would ever uh, let it be run by, by just the staff. Uh, there's so many, so many things that need to be done that require a manager approval um, that you, you can't even operate the, uh, the computer systems for certain tasks without a manager present. Yeah. Okay. Um... And I wonder maybe exempting the um, private clubs and veterans clubs in this too. I like I like the idea of just a manager, but um, I know at least the VFW I used to go there. They pretty much just have one person. I mean, I'm not I'm not necessarily uncomfortable with the idea of if if it really is like an establishment like that. That's it is just one bartender, and that's basically they run the show. If we wanted to mandate that we could, but again, I, I don't feel that it's so um, necessary. Uh, I think I think we'd be better off serving being served by uh, mandating 
ID scanners than we would be by by TIP certification if we really wanted to, if we were really trying to address a problem here. Um, which I think one of the things, I don't even know if it's really offered anywhere. I know when I had worked in a, as a bouncer uh, years ago at Sackers and McMurphy's, we had the ID scanner, but you know, no one's particularly trained on how to use it. So sometimes you scan an ID and it will come back with certain uh, failings, but you scan it again and it will come back just fine. Um, and yeah, some of the IDs, I had uh, borrowed a fake one from somebody who I work with at uh, the restaurant and I tried it on a scanner to see what would happen. I'd taken it to the McMurphy's one and it fails the way that it should. Um, but sometimes real IDs would fail in that way as well, at least in my experience when I had used to do it. Um, so I think an area there, if we're really looking to, to improve something, maybe we should try to figure something out like that. Is there anything useful out there? Is there something affordable for restaurants to, to sign up for? I'm not sure, but even something like that, I think would serve us better than, than mandating tip certification for, uh, for, uh, anyone really okay so we just are we leaving it in there just as the met for the manager or what did no i prefer that i think it's it's worthwhile to have that that okay. in i think just you know, one I, part, I, at I, least. I, I do i do respect that the point dylan's making i think there are some higher leverage things we might consider like scanners, you know, yeah. that, that may be a consideration, but again, you know, that's the scanners is a, it's a tricky one. Cause I think, you know, when, when, uh, I think it was, um, when, uh, uh, the spoke came, you know, they were expanding their space and they were talking about it and, and, you know, he spoke to what that expense was and that you really have to be diligent about keeping the software up to date so that it continues to, to get the latest, uh, you know, uh, updates on what what kind of things are being used and to, to sort of pick up the machine. So, you know, that's a that's a, an interesting burden to place on the business. Uh, you know, it may be a thing. My suggestion maybe is is around electronic scanners. Is maybe in places where, uh, you know, they're they're general all alcohol or general, you know, uh, and not as much a restaurant because I think the likelihood of a restaurant. Uh, is less. I mean, although we have had trouble in restaurants too. So, I mean, it's. Well, that's why cool. we reserve the right. Yeah. So that I feel like if that's a consistent problem, it's there. So if we go to a restaurant and say, no, you, you know, you've come before us, you need a scanner. It's, it's there. So they should anticipate that it could, you know, problem. And we can write, you know, if concerns arise the board, but I think. I don't. I don't see us mandating it for restaurants anytime right. soon. Right. Mm -hmm. I would agree. Would we want to make the tip certification something we would mandate if there's like a violation? I think I was just thinking about that, and I was also thinking about that relative to scanners too. Is that that could be you know something that's a consideration? Uh, you know, maybe in lieu of suspending a license, we have them get a scanner um, or. You know something like that or or you know it, it i think that's an interesting idea of of whether that could be part of the um you know sort of uh discipline as it were you know in those circumstances i don't know if that becomes an addendum to their license that has that requirement you know i don't know i think it is something we could order in a in a violation notice yeah, I think about sort of, is it persistent and required for subsequent renewal for just that one license holder? You know, that kind of thing I think about. Um, it, just a pragmatic sort of, you know, renewal and, and that sort of thing, you know. Um, and uh, that's not to say we shouldn't do it. I'm just saying we just wanna be clear so that the businesses have a clear understanding of their expectations if that were to happen to them. So I guess I just want to be clear because we had some some different different opinions. So we had um, Doug was in favor of um, tips for manager. Dylan mm -hmm. was in favor of not really not not requiring tips for anybody. Um, 
how he's seen favor of tips from manager Gaston and Marion. How do you? Well, I mean, I, I will say that the, this whole sentence is premise is prefaced with ordinarily the following will be the uh, criteria. So this is not a you know terribly binding mm -hmm. sentence. And so I, I think the idea of ordinarily we're looking for tip certification for the manager. I'm I'm fine with that. I think this would be more on point. There's a couple of places where it was. Okay. I, I, I don't have any opposition to um, managers having tip certification that we mandate that. I, I have no opposition to that at all. Um, it's just something that it, it, if it were just up to me, I really could go either way on it. All right. Well, it seems like there's a, a consensus for manager. Yeah. Um, but when we say manager, it's like the official manager, as opposed to some idea that there has to be someone, who, who, the acting manager, right? Yeah. yeah. Do we want to just say the acting manager? I like that. Oh, okay. So that's that's a stronger requirement than just the manager, which is like one person who who knows how many hours they're there. I mean, if we're gonna do yeah. it at all, I mean, we might as well I think, do it the right way and have it be the acting manager. I would agree with that. Okay. okay. And we should, you know, if we look at the so, cost of what people are spending on their liquor license, a seventy-five dollar tip certification so, is not <laughs> that. You know, it's not nothing, but it's right. And so, just to get back to Gaston's point about the beginning of the sentence, should we take out ordinarily since we are? I mean, we want this. It's not like usually we want this, but. On Thursday, some Thursdays we we don't, you know. Yeah. Ordinarily, the following criteria and requests. So, the following criteria and prerequisites for evaluating only licenses are tip certification for the acting yeah. manager, physical I, space. Is that? Do we take that? Well, out? yeah. I mean, even if we say it's the criteria, we 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 it's not binding us. So I, I'm fine okay. with deleting ordinarily and. Okay. Um. I also don't know. Like, would we would we ever use these for for license violations? I mean, we wouldn't necessarily. I, mean, I feel like that's kind of. I mean, we wouldn't look at their like site plan for a, a license violation unless we just kind of get orientation. I mean, and modifications. I mean, it could just be a uh, a change of manager or something. We wouldn't necessarily look at the the site plan or the public need or anything. Would well, we just want to make this evaluating all all new licenses? We could say and if applicable, and if relevant. I like that. Just to follow up while you're typing that in, Steve, the 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 idea of you know the idea of acting manager, I think we define that in our definitions, you know, as as you know, sort of person on premises during. I mean, you don't have to do it right now, but I think we can add an acting manager yeah. uh, definition just because I think that is distinct from manager that's required by you know ABCC. I think that, and I'm trying to recall whether or not we've had this conversation before. Speaking of the sort of manager of record. Um, you know, this came up a little bit with, with uh, I forget who it was now, they had the same person serving in the role. Oyster Bar and Protocol, yeah, that's kind of why I brought it up too. Well, I think how that, often that person really is there. Yeah, I think that we want to, we want to have, we may want to set some sort of parameter about what that expectation is around that person in that management role. Mm. Uh, and I'm not saying it's 40 hours a week. I think that's not fair, to be honest, but I do think that there is some level of of on-site um, active management that they they need to be participating in, I, I would suggest. I'm I'm not I'm open to opinion on this because I'm sort of brainstorming it here a little bit, but I I, I, I do think we want to define that a little bit. And I I'm trying to recall if we if the ABCC has anything around that. Do they frame that? I think they do. They say something like, "Oh, you know, uh, you know, they they do define the manager." In a way, if if I remember from reading it a while ago, uh, you know, they they don't specify like number of hours, but they sort of imply that it's somebody that regularly is in the business, you know, and for a you know significant amount of time, like pretty much you know all year long kind of thing. So they they are, and again, I'm I'm going from memory here, so I may be misremembering, but I think they kind of 
the ABCC. I think in some of its documentation has kind of framed that a little bit for us. Um, so I think we might want to look at that and and put that in part of the definition of manager. And then the word full time doesn't have to be here. It can just say you know manager of record or whatever we want to call that term, as opposed to an acting manager who's like actively running the crew that evening. Um, you know, it's not necessarily named on the license, but that's some just just some suggestions around that piece that we were talking about. Yeah, that's. I think that's definitely something. I think the ABCC asks how many hours they will be there, but I don't know what they would cut it off at if somebody put in, you know, three or something. Um, one thing before we get off the topic of the uh, tip certification, we're all talking about on premises, right? Not off premises. Right. Yes. Yes. Okay. So. I'll just make a note here. I know we're getting kind of late here. We have a couple other things to finish, so um, we don't. I won't necessarily type everything out if I can. Um, so we agree we'll change that to reflect what's in the um, the uh, the uh, license text itself. Um, I think this is an interesting one. And Hallie, if uh, if I understand, if I remember correctly, you were saying that that would be something um, that would be done maybe preemptively if there was like a Blarney blowout or a St. Patrick's Day coming or something. Exactly, but I, I'm totally fine with taking that out to people who don't feel comfortable about that because that's probably something more we would do for a short-term liquor license. Yeah, but, you know, that's an interesting. It's an interesting section because, it, it, just to tie back to our earlier conversation about. Um, you know, host community agreements have some of that language as well about securing premises and that sort of stuff. I don't think it's come to be a problem for anybody. I think, you know, um, there are there are some things where if the, and, and this happened, Northampton actually had to enforce theirs, I, I think a little bit when, when it was so busy, when when that uh, first opened there over by the bowling alley, because the crowds and, and the, you know, they've got the roundabout right there, <clears throat> but they required um, the business to, uh, pay for detail officers to manage traffic and that sort of thing, um, which is a little different circumstance than what we're talking about here. But I think it 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 does beg the question if we if we want to put something like this in here relative to this, uh, you know, maybe a consideration, you know, for the uh, for the the marijuana retail as a just as a you know again and it sort of begs that question is like should it be here should it not, you know, do, do we undermine our authority to sort of exert that requirement? Um, or is it something that's kind of covered by other people's rights in responsibility? So does the town manager have a, 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 you know, or the police chief have the authority to say, you know, this circumstance requires us to be on, on, on site and we're going to, you know, uh, charge you for it, that kind of thing. I don't know, you know, whether the manager, you know, town manager or the police chief have authority to, to sort of on their own take care of what's in that section. Kind of pose the question to you, Steve. Well, they they can certainly post a police officer. I don't know if they can make um, the licensee pay for it. I mean, I would not have thought it was in our authority to make um, to make them pay for something like that anyway, outside of a disciplinary violation. But KP Law reviewed it; they didn't say anything. So, huh. yeah. yeah, I think if, you know sometimes you know you can you can charge people for nuisance. Like if you do a false alarm, you can be charged you know a nuisance fee basically. Um, you know, it could kind of fall under that category of, of uh, kind of a nuisance charge or a, I don't, I don't really mean nuisance because obviously we're thinking about public safety and so we're trying to have them there for, for you know, and about keeping things safe and, and under control. So anyway, not sure the right answer. I'm afraid I, I'm going to need to step away shortly. I have another meeting at seven and oh, I, I okay. need to eat something. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, we are running pretty late here. Maybe we'll, okay. um, we'll leave this here to continue. Yeah, why don't we continue our discussion until next time? Thanks so much, Hallie. And oh. um, what, did, what else do we have yet? Jeez, it's almost seven. Okay. Um, uh, we have Jim. the letter to licensees. Okay. Do we have minutes today? Did anyone have a, are you going now Gaston? No, I just want, I have one comment to the letter which kind of came okay. up and, and that is that it seems like the important thing is not not just the scanner, but having this a service um, that that's the magic happens with your subscription. It's really like, you know, software as a service is what's doing the work. 
Oh, you mean updating this the software? Um, yeah. Um, so make sure your software you is updated. Use the most current. Use. Um, I mean, I don't know what if there's one most current, but and subscribe to um, a service that is updating. I don't know what the, the best way to explain it, but yeah. Um, what's important is that they're they're uh, updating the software to catch the latest, uh, you know, advances in Chinese fake ID technology. Okay. All right. That's that was my only comment. That the I comment. Had. Okay. Like the, that can be changed. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's I, a good. Yeah. Go ahead, Steve. I'm going to be out tomorrow, but I can give you a call on Tuesday and we can kind of just um, okay. this up and send it out that day. That sounds great. Okay. And it was just a very rough draft draft. So, um, but if everyone's okay with it, then I can just talk to Steve and we'll get it out. Um, great. Any topics not anticipated 48 hours prior to the meeting? No. I am and done. The, okay. And there are no me, no minutes. And our next meeting is on, 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 sorry. I just lost my calendar. The 15th, I think. The 15th. It's on the 15th at five on the Thursday. Okay. Oh my gosh, um, everything is on. That's the block party too, I think. Oh. That, that's fine. Okay. After party? In person at the block party. Right. Yeah. We can hold office hours. Okay. And we have no minutes today? No. No. All right. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Thank you, Doug, as their second. Thank Thanks. you, Dylan. No discussion. Let's take a vote. Um, Dylan. Aye. Kelly. Aye. Doug? Aye. Gaston? Aye. And I vote aye, uh, five to zero. We are adjourned at 6.47 PM. All right. Thanks, Thank everybody. Thank you all very much. Great meeting. Okay. Bye. bye. See you next bye. time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye. Yeah.